All right, you guys, number one is E, so it's significantly different. Basically, it's not going to be more or less frequent or always smaller or always larger. It's just really different from all the rest of the observations. And remember, our new definition of outlier is actually that it's uh, got a really large residual. Uh, we would call an influential point something that influences anything on the line, the slope, the R value, or anything. Okay, number two, we want to go to the 95th percentile here and then go down. And so our answer is E at least 200. This is actually a good old fashioned pre algebra problem. Uh, I don't feel like we've actually done a lot of these recently, but there's 128 people who have this salary, 28,500 and 32 people who have this salary, 22,500, divided by the total people, so this plus this, and you should get D. Okay, number four, anytime you have skewed data, the best measure of center is the me median. So be sure you do B on this one. Remember that means are pulled up towards the tail. So that outlier at 14 will pull the mean up. So it's not an unbiased estimator. Um, and then IQR quartiles, IQR and quartiles, or just standard deviation, are not measures of center. Neither is the first quartile. Number five. So the way this reads is a little bit backwards, but this is the conditional part. If the weather is dry, there's a 0.2% chance of an accident. If the weather is wet, there's 1%. That's the conditional part, and so it needs to come second. So the first thing we set up is just, is the weather wet or dry? So we have a 20% chance of wet, an 80% chance of dry. And then if it's wet, there's a 1% chance of an accident, so a 99% chance of no accident. And if it's dry, there's a 0.2%. So be sure you move the decimal two to the left. And then not a chance would be 1 minus that, so 0.998, okay? What's the probability of an accident? <laughs> so there's two paths to get to accident here. And we're going to multiply this times this. And then we add for our or this times this. And that gives you D. Okay, number six. So this one's just kind of a tough read, I felt like. They are talking about two years. So you hire 100 people who are going to stay for two years. Uh, and for those 100, 20% no longer work there. That means you keep 80% of them. So at the end of the first year, there are 80 workers. And then on that second year, only 5% quit, which means you're going to retain 95% of them. So 80 times 95%. This gives us the final number of people after two years of that first group. But the second year, they hired 100 more people, and we only keep 80% of those because it's still the first year for those people. So we kept 80 of that group. And then we got to add these two numbers together to get D156. Okay, number seven. Just do norm CDF. We want to know more than 225. So our lower bound is 225. Our upper bound is a big number. The mean is 210, and the standard deviation is 10, and that gives you D, 6.68%. Okay, number eight. So you're adding a bunch of separate means, okay, three random variables, and a bunch of sta separate standard deviations. If you add the means, you would just add them. But remember, with standard deviations, you have to add their variances. So these three numbers are the standard deviations they gave us. And so we add the variances and take the square root. So we do 2 squared plus 0.15 squared plus 0.25 squared, and we square root it, and you should get E. All right, number nine, best interpretation of this confidence interval. So A says 95% of the students in our school are from families whose income is in between this and this. So the 95% is the capture rate of the true mean, not the percentage who are in between. So my true mean is somewhere in between here. It could be closer to here or closer to here. We don't know where. 
but we capture it 95% of the time based on our confidence interval. Uh, there's a 95% probability that the families of all the students in the school have an income between this and this. That kind of is saying the same thing, um, not what we're looking for. C, if we were to take another sample of the same size and compute a 95% confidence interval, we would have a 95% chance of getting this interval. Nope, so if you take another sample, this could be a totally different interval um, based on a different sample that we've got. Okay. This next one's only a problem because it's talking about the mean of another sample. There's a 95% probability that the mean of another sample with the same size will fall between those two numbers. Uh, there's a 95% probability that the true mean is going to be in that interval, but not just another sample mean. All right, so E is correct because this is talking about the true mean um, being inside that interval. Then that's the capture rate. So yes, it is E. All right, so type 1, type 2 errors. You definitely need to know these. So our null hypothesis in this case is basically we have a safe level of lead. Okay, our alternate hypothesis is that it's above a safe level, all right? So then we'd have to close down the park. So a type 1 error is rejecting the null when we should not have. So if I reject the null, I got this, that it's above, we've got a problem, it's not safe, but in reality it was safe. So it is A, closing the park when the lead levels are within the allowed limit. Okay, we've got another one of these. I feel like we did one really similar to this earlier. The correct answer is D on this one. Okay, number 12, uh, we're looking for which one has the closest mean and median. Um, the ones that are going to have the closest mean and median is going to be the most symmetric. So this one right here is the most symmetric. This guy's skewed pretty far to the right, skewed pretty far to the right. This guy's got some outliers. So it is station two. Okay, number 13. So which of the following statements about the confidence interval to estimate the mean pedal length is true? If we got significant results at the 5% level, that means that we got that the alternate is true. And if the alternate is true, then it's outside of the confidence interval. And if it's outside the confidence interval, you've got to match it up with what test you're doing. So we have a 5% level of significance. And so this guy is B. The specified mean length of 3.5 centimeters is not within a 90% confidence interval. So let me specify why this is not 95%. So if you have your 3.5 in the middle, um, if it's at the 5% level of significance and we have about 2.5% on either tail, right? And so it's definitely not within the 95% confidence interval. Well, if it's not within the 95% confidence interval, it's also not within the 90% confidence interval because that just adds more area to the tails. So it means the same thing. So it's either within or not within, and you just want to make sure that still works. But it's not going to be talking about the lower limit necessarily. All right. Uh, number 14. So we've got 40 jars. And we're talking about means, and so 40 jars is greater than or equal to 30, so you can use norm CDF on this problem. And we want to know uh, that all the sample jars, the mean amount is less than 3.9. So we want to have a lower bound of negative 1,000, an upper bound of 3.9, a mean of 4. And here's where I would expect some people to get messed up. Be careful that you did not use... 0.25 because this is the standard deviation from one jar, all right, or the population. We're talking now about taking 40 jars and doing that a bunch of times. And so I need to use my formula sigma over the square root of n for a sample mean. And so I do 0.25 over the square root of 40, which is 0.039. And that gives me A. 
Okay, number 15, we want the middle 50%. Uh, they do say it's normally distributed. So the middle 50% means like from Q1 to Q3. And so if I do inverse norm, area of 0.25, mean and standard deviation of what they tell me, and then inverse norm 0.75 with our mean and standard deviation that they give us, you get A, and that is the middle 50%. All right, I would type these into your calculator, list one and list two. And that way, your box and whisker, you don't necessarily have to run the five number summary. So once you type it in, you can go to control, doc, add date and statistics, and let's put catalyst A on here. And then go to menu, plot type, change it to a box plot. And you can actually plot them on the same page, but let me show you too. If you highlight or hover over, you can get your Q1 or your min, your Q1, your median, etc. All right. Um, this is cool. If you go to menu, plot properties, and go to add X value, you can plot it on the same graph. So now I want catalyst B. And then they show up side by side, which is just kind of neat, and you can highlight over to get all of your data. That way you can sketch a nice graph. So don't forget on the AP exam, you need a title, you need to label your number line, and I would label each of these. All right, so part A, which one uh, should it use if you want the shortest reaction time? So notice that this min is slightly less, Q3 is slightly less, the median is less, Q2 is less, and the min is less, all on catalyst B. So you want to use catalyst B because all are shorter than catalyst A in those relative positions. And then for this one, if we want to just be as consistent as possible, we're looking for less spread. There's a shorter range. There's a smaller IQR. Um, and so that would be catalyst B.